Well, I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk, and I'm here with Andy Stewart. Andy is CEO with Evoke Data Centers, and Andy, we've done this before. Yeah, number three. Uh, number three, but we've never gotten to do it in person. So uh, hopefully, that's a sign, good sign for all of us that things absolutely. are getting, you know, back to normal. But thank you for hosting us. We're in your Web Chapel uh, Data Center in Dallas, uh, newly acquired, which I want to get to oh, yeah. you know, here in a minute. But before we do, maybe give me and everybody an update on Evoke and what's been going on the last several years. Yeah, so there's so many things to talk about. I think yeah. the, the one I'd want to focus on, on right now, though, is, uh, is how much more focused we are today than when you and I spoke a year ago or even, even two years ago. Yeah. So the business started off with 31 data centers in 11 countries around the globe. And uh, that's, that's really cool in a, in a headline, <laughs> but it's not so cool uh, from a financial standpoint, from an operations standpoint, you realize kind of how challenging that can be. And uh, when you and I first talked, I didn't appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And over the last year in particular, we've made tremendous progress in terms of carving out what I would say are the non-strategic sites and really focusing in on a kind of core 11 or 12 data centers um, that, that came with the transaction. And that, uh, first of all, the, the, the effort to carve those out is, is pretty difficult, but our, our banks worked with us and Brookfield's been an awesome partner to, to kind of take on more of that. Um, but that focus allows us to sell into a much kind of tighter group of, of sites allows us to focus our maintenance capital, focus all of our marketing. So um, compared to where we were just a little bit ago, now having that focus on just these core, these core 11 acquired plus one um, makes, a, makes a huge difference. Yeah, and so, and, and also in that time, I think you guys have acquired some companies, you know, from a consulting perspective. Um, and there've, there've also been other achievements along the way. Like what else would you list as some of the things that y'all have done that you look back on and go, I'm really proud of that. Yeah, so, so first it started with the Foghorn acquisition. Yep. Um, just being plain vanilla co-location is, is really hard. And I was just so tired of us responding to RFPs and only being able to win on price. Yeah. So Foghorn gave us the ability to kind of jump ahead in the conversation, talk to the decision makers, really the IT strategy makers within an organization. And as opposed to just responding to the colo needs, talk to them about their applications in general and being application and infrastructure agnostic uh -huh. so you could really be a partner for where things needed to be, whether that was in one of the Evoke data centers or, or in cloud. So, so that was a big first step. Um, have totally rebuilt the management team uh, hmm. as well. So it started bringing in uh, Catherine Smith, who was originally our general counsel, and now is that plus chief strategy officer. And she has HR and IT and marketing, plus legal, so, sure. so she was a great addition and real fixer. And then just recently, this year, we uh, brought in Kozum Lokundwala from AWS. Yep. Kozum had been at Amazon for 17 years, had been a part of AWS for the last decade or so, most recently running global data center delivery and uh, power procurement for them. So uh, bringing Kozum on board has given us such a better mindset into, into the hyperscalers, into acquiring land and power, uh, and, and while he was brought in originally as CFO, he's actually brought on the title of COO as okay. well. So he is uh, just taking on more and more responsibility. Uh, and then our sales leaders are doing a great job. So, so you know, rebuilding the team yeah, has sure. also been important. And then um, lastly is, uh, is, is the, the growth. Um, we, we, um, we went down the path with enterprise customers uh -huh. and Foghorn. We also built a hyperscale sales team and we've landed five, now six hyperscale edge deals. So it uh, really helps validate the quality of our data centers, the yeah. quality of the infrastructure, sure. even if the, the buildings themselves are a little bit older. Yeah, and that's, you know, watching that hyperscale part of our industry evolve has really been interesting because we, we talk about the, these huge projects that these companies need and have, and I don't think those are going away anytime soon. And then also some of these, I wouldn't even call them smaller requirements because they're not small. They're still, you know, yeah. rather large uh, that maybe we put in that you know edge uh, category for them, but uh, you know we're sitting in this new building that you all acquired recently, and I want to just get your thoughts on what the thought behind acquiring something like this was, and what why it was attractive to you. Yeah, so uh, we really want to own as much of our real estate as possible. Of our core uh, twelve data centers, yep. we actually own eight of them outright. Would love to acquire the rest over time, if at all possible. And Web Chapel in particular is, is great because it really gives us the ability to, to have a true data center campus in mm -hmm. central Dallas. Um, we're able to convert the non-data center space to active data center space over time, um, able to grow our customer base here and work with the utility to make sure we can bring in plenty of power as well. 
Yeah, and that's, I think the Dallas acquisition, obviously very strategic. I think it's one of the things that if you want to play in the, certainly the hyperscale uh, sector moving forward, I think the creativity behind finding areas you can build campuses. Yeah. You know, I think one of the uh, mistakes a lot of people make about our industry is, oh, you can build a data center anywhere and there's plenty of land and power to do it. And I think we all know and have experienced the last few years that that's, that's not the case. But one of the really interesting markets that we've talked about is Nashville. And you all just made a pretty strategic uh, acquisition there as well. So talk about that. We did. So the site itself is, is pretty spectacular, but it's mm -hmm. not just that, it's also the market. So, yeah. so Nashville is very, very business friendly, uh, has great connectivity. The, the enterprise um, economy is just, is just booming and growing mm -hmm. really fast. Uh, and then this site in particular has power. Uh, yeah, it has sure. a lot of power. <laughs> uh, we're right uh, adjacent to a 50 megawatt substation. We actually have the ability to grow that to 100 megawatts over time. Uh, so this is kind of part of the evolution of Evoke, where we're going to ha start having these larger campuses uh, fully powered. And one of the p aspects of the property in particular, it is not just next to the substation, it's next to the billion dollar metadata center that's sure. going in. So we see our data center plus meta as being kind of an anchor for growth in that region over time. Yeah. And, and we're excited to bring that to market in the, the next 18, 24 months. Yeah, one of the things we were talking about before was how I think we all expect to see some growth in, in maybe these secondary markets that traditionally haven't seen the large growth that Atlanta, Chicago, Phoenix, Dallas, yeah. Northern Virginia, the, the bigger data center markets have. So, you know, I think areas like Nashville, Columbus, Salt Lake City, Austin are very interesting for opportunities like that. The other thing you mentioned, which is a really good um, point, is around the clustering of data centers. And, and a lot of times the growth that we see, you know, is with the uh, the validation of an area by yeah. a large end user or even a couple of co-location providers and then you really start to see some growth. So I'm excited. That'll be fun to watch yeah. and a fun place to visit too on your, yeah. Oh you know, yeah. if you have to go to a city it's, to yes. check up on a data center. Exactly, right? Great music, great That's food. Right. You're good. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, going there in a, in a month. Yeah, so. what, are, what are some of the other areas, you know, from a ge geographic perspective yeah. that you and the Evoke team are thinking about growing? So in? I'd say first we're actually looking to expand on site in the existing portfolio. Sure. So we have the ability to bring 10 or 15 megawatts of capacity uh, to the market in Ashburn, okay. which everybody knows how, um, how kind of rare power yes. is becoming sure. in that market. Uh, 20 megawatts in Chicago and another uh, 10 or 15 in, uh, in, in Boston and um, I mentioned Dallas already. Yeah. So excited to grow there. Uh, we are, uh, we're expanding in Secaucus, New Jersey. Okay, We've sure. seen a huge amount of demand from financial services uh, players in, in that market. Which is interesting because I feel like for a while the financial services sector there kind of grew quiet yeah. and then a year or two ago, I mean, all of a sudden they were back in the market and they were back big. Back, back big, yeah. Yes. So there, were, there was one RFP, so we're doing a six megawatt annex, which we're really excited about. That's going to be live next year. Uh, and one of the RFPs that came to market started, it was going to fit in that building perfectly, and then all of a sudden they decided to double it. So, sure. um, yeah, just talking about the yeah. size of the deals, yep. uh, it's, it's getting a lot bigger. So, so first is to expand uh, in the markets yep. where we already are, um, benefits of kind of the economies of scale from yep. an operating standpoint, uh, time to market and having a kind of built-in pipeline. But we are actively looking in other markets as well. Uh, we hope to announce an acquisition of some land in the Southwest in the, in the first quarter of next year. Oh, that's great. And then actively working with uh, the Brookfield team to expand into Europe. That's great. Well, talk about Brookfield for a second, because that's a big part of the Evoke story. I mean, how yeah. has that allowed the company to grow and just like thinking about the future, what does that enable you to do? So, so Brookfield, honestly, was one of the biggest reasons I took the job. Yeah. And uh, you kind of take a leap of faith that your, your partner, your investor, is going to kind of be as good as you think they are, yeah. and they've been, they've been better. So one thing you and I are talking about is just a traditional private equity mindset. I've worked with private sure. equity firms the last 20 years. And they're great to work with, but they have a much shorter window. Yes. And they're thinking in a three to five year increments, usually. Um, it's taken me for a while to kind of step back from that thinking and think in kind of a decades long kind of approach, yep. which is really the way Brookfield does. Sure. So when it comes great. to owning the real estate or working with renewable energy or going into a new market, thinking about what that market might look like in 10 years yep. and how we can actually develop this over the long term has been uh, has been really interesting and kind of eye opening for me. Yeah, sure. Um, and then their their knowledge of real estate, their knowledge of power uh, has been instrumental in kind of our, our growth. And and frankly, just good people. Yeah, uh, that's which awesome. makes all the difference. That's what you want. Yeah. yeah. Um, if we go back to when the pandemic started, you know, I think 
in the people in the industry would agree that we saw a number of like the companies uh, that needed to, employees to work from home, like their infrastructure needs grow, their network needs grow. Um, and so we've, we've kind of started to come out of that a bit. Uh, people are somewhat back in the office, and so that's gone down. People work from home, that's, you know, maybe a little bit. But have you seen that change, much of the need for infrastructure? Do you see a decrease in, you know, the needs that are out there today? How has that been for Evoke? No, I'd say we're, so we are seeing bigger deals on average than sure. we did before. I know during the pandemic, just tremendous growth in cloud, and yep. not just cloud consumption, but also in cloud data centers. Uh, but I think it's also helped crystallize for, for businesses um, if they're going into Colo, they're going all in, right? Yeah. And they're, as opposed to Evoke, like old Evoke might have chased those 10, you know, 50 KW kind of deals. Yep. And now our pipeline is filled up with 100 KW deals, yeah. multi-megawatt deals. Yeah. So really seeing um, a, a big uptick in, in demand. And it's kind of been reflected also in our, in our bookings. So sure. um, when you think of not just MRR, but kind of total contract value, yeah. for the fourth quarter of 2022, we will have roughly four to, to five times the amount of TCV booked as we did 18 months ago. Wow, man, that's a, that's a huge difference. Uh, talk about spend agility. It's something oh, yeah. that you all are putting into the market and allowing users to do some different things from a, a financial perspective with you all. What's that about? Yeah, so the, the concept behind Foghorn that I mentioned was was getting in front of those conversations and being more more strategic. Yep. And that that's, that's worked, but there were still kind of separate businesses. They, we had cloud consulting and we had co-location and they, they cross, cross-pollinated ideas yep. and sales, but that didn't really, it, they didn't kind of take it to the next level of the customer. So what we did is we rolled out Spend Agility just this, this past month. And what Spend Agility allows customers to do is deploy their colo racks inside Evoke, but after a certain period of time, um, they can shift that spend into the cloud consulting group, they can shift that spend into cloud consumption, and, and basically, um, you know, pare down their, their contractual obligation with Evoke by shifting into the cloud. Yeah. So what we've heard again and again is that the customers don't want um, kind of vendor lock-in. Hmm. They don't want to, they, they know certain applications are destined to go to the cloud, that's where they, where they belong, but they don't want to sign a three or a five year colo yeah. agreement, be stuck in that, in that situation and then not be able to move after the fact. Interesting. Or they don't know if they're gonna have, they want to do it next year, but they're not sure if they're gonna have the budget to do it. So by moving into the Evoke data center and having this spend agility kind of backing them up, when they're ready to move to the cloud, they can. And if they're ready to keep it in Colo, we're you know, happy to have them. Yeah, sure. The, and and you know, I think this is really beneficial for, it's beneficial probably for all customers, but yeah. certainly those that are in that you know, smaller range and you know, 50 KW to 500 KW and maybe even, even larger. But you know, that smaller group of like enterprise users, mm -hmm. I think one of the, um, the, the mistakes people also make about our space is thinking it's only been the hyperscale group that's been yeah. growing because it's also been, you know, it's been banks, it's been uh, insurance companies, it's been technology companies that are back yeah. in the market. What are some of the other challenges you see those companies having when they think about their infrastructure planning or they think about, you know, moving in from on-prem to like a co-location facility? I mean, what are some of the challenges with those smaller users? So, um, I'd say it's a kind of capacity planning, trying to understand hmm. how much power they're gonna need and when they need it. Yep. So a number of our bigger deals have included rofers. And these are with technology companies, gaming companies, financial services, and it might be 100 or 250 KW out of the gate, but they, they want a path towards the, another 250 sure. or 500 yeah. KW. So that's been a, a challenge for them. Um, finding a partner who is, is thinking about their long-term success with cloud. Yeah. So that's, that's resonated where we've had a couple of customers we've kind of throwing out the idea, the concept of spend agility. Yep. And like, that's exactly what we need. We, we, did, we didn't know we needed yeah, it, but that's sure. what we need. Yeah, when right? you describe we, it, yeah. I want that. Yeah, yeah. We, I knew I was confused. They, they, they knew they, they didn't know exactly how to, to get that hybrid solution long term. Yep. And we're not trying to be everything, right? Sure. We're not trying to be a managed service provider. We don't offer private cloud. Uh, we have partners that do that. But so many, uh, so many workloads are kind of, they leapfrog private cloud. They're destined to be you know, re-architected, redesigned, and go from colo to cloud. So, so by bringing them the, the spend agility, giving yeah. them the, the, the ability to scale power yep. over time is, is kind of solving, solving those challenges. Sure. Um, you know, just kind of wrapping up from a crystal ball perspective yeah. and how the, the industry will look in you know, three to five years and maybe even longer, what, what do you, 
you know, when you think about your portfolio growing, end user needs, um, and all the challenges that come along with that, I mean, where do you think the industry will be? Well, several years I mean, the, the, the biggest push right now is around sustainability, renewable power. Mm -hmm. um, you and I were talking about just the need for, for power. So um, at my previous company, we had a uh, data center in Nashville, and it was one and a half megawatts. Yeah. And that was a lot, sure. right? In, t in 2015, one and a half megawatts was a lot. It was, it was, it was the right amount. Yep. Um, and now our build in Nashville is going to be six or nine megawatts out of the gate, and the campus yeah. is going to be 50 megawatts. Sure. Same exact market, but the dynamics have changed. Yeah. Um, so Crystal Ball is, is just seeing bigger and bigger data center campuses, yeah. uh, but bringing renewable energy uh, to that mix. Um, and not just renewable energy through PPAs, but true renewable energy solutions delivered mm -hmm. to the data center. And with that, much more kind of sustainable designs, driving PUE down, driving water usage down. Yeah. Um, that's, I'm not being um, terribly like unique saying that, but it's pretty easy to see the trends that have happened the last three years, that that's just gonna continue, but just gain more momentum. Andy, thank you so much for letting us be here. It was great to complete the trilogy uh, from a discussion perspective and look forward to the next one. Absolutely, David, thank you for coming.